Hello, everyone, <clears throat> and welcome to my humble kitchen at home, not at my restaurant. Um, thank you for inviting me uh, to be a part of the statewide gathering and uh, for being the, having the honor of being the clo closing speaker. And um, I'm looking forward to sharing some thoughts with you as we wrap this up. Um, so I'm going to now start by sharing my presentation entitled, How the Pandemic Could Save Our Local Food System. It was on the Ides of March, which was also Black Trumpet's lucky 13th anniversary, that was the last day of indoor dining for restaurants in the state of New Hampshire. Experts, of course, predicted that restaurants would be the hardest hit. That was the nature of, of this virus and its uh, way to the way that it communicate or is uh, spread and restaurants of course are super spreaders as we know or at least have the potential to be so as we look back now we know that with a few exceptions uh, experts were right shortly before the lockdown we had one last jolt of good news when black trumpet was nominated for the james beard foundation's national award for best hospitality certainly the greatest honor that we've ever been uh, given Although we didn't win the award, um, when the wor world came to a screeching halt, uh, it was a lingering memory of the good times that we were able to keep with us, um, sort of holding close to our heart when, when our heart was being broken by all of the, the sadness around us. So now we're a year, a year later and looking back on that anniversary, and we have statistics now to show how severe this has been for restaurants. According to the NRA, uh, over 120,000 restaurants in the US have closed permanently since last year at this time, which is almost 20% of restaurants. In the state of New Hampshire, I recently checked in um, with some local authorities and was told that over 200 restaurants have closed in the last year, which means we're doing a lot better on average than neighboring states and uh, the nation as a whole. The Main Street Fund might have been uh, one of the contributing factors. It certainly was for us at Black Trumpet, as well as PPP money that I'll talk about in a second, and Rally for New Hampshire Restaurants, which was started by an HLRA. Uh, all of them were very in invaluable in getting us through. In that conversation where I was trying to find those statistics, I spoke with Mike Summers, who heads up the NHLRA. And this was a quote from him. He said, we are hopeful that if we continue to see numbers improve in, in New Hampshire, we would be positioned to have a spectacular summer. So I'm taking him at his word, and I hope that others will join me in sharing his optimism that uh, we will hopefully be coming out of this in this summer and seeing a powerful rebound for our small businesses. Black Trumpet was one of the first uh, restaurants to receive uh, PPP money, so Payroll Protection Program, when it was issued last spring. Uh, we were one of the first to apply, one of the first to receive it, and the parameters of that at the time were that we could receive the forgivable loan and put the money to work right away but we, uh, we had eight weeks to use it and 100% of it had to go toward payroll. So um, we didn't know, no one knew how long this was gonna be, this pandemic and all of the uh, you know, associated hazards of it. But I did know that if we had eight weeks to use that money, we were gonna have to be super creative to figure out a path to get through this turbulence, even if we didn't know how long it was gonna be. So here's what we did. We put our PPP money directly to work uh, in ways that we couldn't use uh, in, in a normal time because uh, we had no restaurant. We had no facility for our front of the house staff to, um, to apply their, their talents. And, so our kitchen staff was reduced significantly because we were only doing takeout and delivery. Uh, so what we did was we, we put that money to work by paying our staff to do house cleaning and home improvements around the restaurant, to doing takeout and delivery. We had some of our servers become delivery drivers. 
One of my favorite things that we did was we, I reached out to all of our, our favorite farmers and asked them if they needed any additional labor, free labor on the farm. And we used our PPP money to pay our front of the house people and some of our kitchen people to work on the farms that provide food for our restaurant. Uh, Body Lasagna is the name of a band uh, that was our first band. And we have a few personnel at Black Trumpet who are very talented musicians. And we had the idea to create a band whose name would change every week, uh, that every Saturday would greet people who were arriving at the restaurant for takeout food. Uh, so they were out there to say thank you. They were out there to entertain. And with masks on, they entertained an awful lot of people over the course of those eight weeks. We live streamed the music as well, and some people followed from all around the country. We also did meal kits for Three River Farmer Alliance. And I think you all uh, probably are familiar with the amazing work of Three River Farmer Alliance. The three farmers who found it, founded it are all uh, imperative voices in our food system and also very good friends of mine. And uh, I'm proud to say that Black Trumpet has been a customer of Three River since its inception. And we've also contributed a lot to it, including putting meal kits together with videos for that eight week period uh, that people could assemble at home using local ingredients. We did a number of how-to cooking videos as well for lots of other causes. And finally, and most importantly, I would argue, we did uh, meals for Gather. Gather, as you most of you know, is a very important um, hunger relief nonprofit based in Portsmouth, but it covers a, a pretty wide swath of our state. And when I saw that we were going to have the money to pay people and not necessarily an audience to eat the food we were making, I thought about what's really needed right now. What, what is the most important thing? Who is the most important uh, audience? And how do we get food to them? So this evolved uh, in fairly short order to um, cooking meals for gathering. So this is sort of reiterating some of that, um, turning lemons into lemonade. We uh, were very fortunate that our staff through that eight week period chose to uh, stay with us and experiment with some sort of crazy different roles that they weren't accustomed to, to playing. And uh, when many other restaurant staffs had uh, chosen to stay home because the unemployment benefits at the time ex exceeded their potential income. Uh, ours chose to stick around and I will never forget that. I will really never forget their commitment and dedication. So uh, when I think about the partnerships that we had forged uh, in the years leading up to the pandemic, but also at the outset of it and during that pivotal eight week period, they, they have ended up being the safety net that we need to survive this. And they will likely be the safety net that gets us through whatever comes next. So all of those partnerships, um, of all of them, Gather certainly has the greatest promise because Gather still has no kitchen of its own. And the lemonade for them is gonna come in the form of in-house meal production, which is a huge next step, but it's one that I am wholly committed to being a part of. And I'm very fortunate that I have a, a very close relationship now with Gather uh, to collaborate on this idea of being able to create in-house meals in the Gather facility, which obviously uh, has to move onward and upward from its current location. This is a little fact sheet on Gather. It is um, impressive to say the least that, um, that they are putting out 1500 meals every week. This number has gone up recently um, and I'll talk about that in a second. There are 350 store members. Those are people who come into their market. They also have mobile markets, which have made a huge dent in getting food to people who would not have otherwise uh, had access to it. They also manage the uh, New Hampshire Food Provider Network, which is 63 pantries in all. 
they are fiscal sponsors for a number of other organizations dedicated to getting food uh, to those who need it. Also, uh, through our relationship with them over the course of this last year, we've been able to do these um, really f fantastic seasonal events that accomplish a couple of goals. We're feeding the people who need food the most, but we're also able to capitalize on local food in its time of greatest abundance. So the first event we did, which you can see photos of here, was Tomato Palooza. And um, that's not a formal name, that's just what we called it. Tomato Palooza um, involved Josh Jennings, once again, uh, in the second photo down there on the left, in his usual pose outside his open door of his truck, uh, brought us uh, over 2,500 pounds of tomatoes. Uh, these are paste tomatoes that were from farms all over New England, uh, but mostly concentrated in our region. And we turned those tomatoes into frozen whole tomatoes, uh, packaged tomatoes, chopped tomatoes, and then we processed lots and lots of them into tomato puree and sauce. All of those went to Gather. And Gather uh, luckily has ample freezer space, although it could be better as they look to scale. Um, but only recently, I think, did we use the last bag of that. So it was from the end of September until right now, we had enough tomato product to provide um, meals to, that we produced for Gather. And as any chef will tell you, tomato is a, a pretty good ingredient to have on hand to whip out a soup or a stew in a, in a heartbeat. And then we did this again in, at Thanksgiving time. So in November, um, Josh was able to pull together a number of farms uh, that were able to deliver through Three River Farmers Alliance the uh, uh, root vegetables and squash that we used to make a vegetable casserole that went to a thousand, over a thousand families. And each of them had that for Thanksgiving dinner. We also did uh, lots of educational videos, which um, through Three River Farmers Alliance and through Gather, uh, there have been these campaigns to share those videos as a fundraiser for those organizations and to help uh, raise awareness of how we can be using local food to feed the food insecure. So during all of this, we also created a lot of jobs. Um, by scaling the operation at Gather to a new location, um, we stand the chance to create even more jobs, which I'll again be talking about shortly. Uh, restaurant affiliations were very important uh, to keep restaurant employees employed, which segues nicely into the next bullet here uh, for Takeout Hunger, which a woman named Helen Crow founded Takeout Hunger just a short couple of months ago to ensure that restaurant employees were getting paid to use restaurants whose kitchens were underutilized uh, to make food for the populations that need it the most, whether it's Gather, uh, in our case, or uh, some other restaurants are working with the Crossroads facility and um, food pantries around the state. So it's a really, really great program that uses Gather as its fiscal umbrella, and it's keeping our restaurant employees at work. So, um, you know, kudos to them for taking what we were doing with Gather and, and expanding it to uh, many restaurants. And that number, I think, has just recently tripled. Uh, I think I heard that recently. So our vision, um, my vision, this is not a formal vision for Gather or anyone else, but what I'm getting from this relationship is that it is possible to feed all people. And then when we've done that, we will know that we've truly democratized our food system. This is just a little phrase that I came up with, um, or paragraph, that when I've been sitting and reflecting on the pandemic and what this is doing to restaurants, I thought maybe there was a lesson that we could all take from the hospitality industry, from restaurants and how we approach what we do. Um, so as we go forth sowing relationships, and you can see some heirloom beans here representing what I mean by that, 
I let's let's think about the black trumpet the black trumpet ethos of uh, hospitality, which which is here. When our staff greets a guest, they exchange knowledge about what makes black trumpet different, as well as what the guest has come to expect of their experience. This is an important ritual that begins a courtship we hope will last for years. Messaging and storytelling are big pieces of this equation. The same can be said for relationships we make with our greater community. By applying a hospitality ethic to our whole society, we can restore integrity, decency, and compassion. So back in May, um, I wrote a letter to our local paper. And in it, uh, I mentioned, uh, I, it was a bit of an outcry, actually, um, that there hadn't been a lot of momentum in the direction of addressing the needs of our downtown businesses in Portsmouth, particularly restaurants. So I pointed out that restaurants comprise the economic heartbeat of our fair city, and I called for a task force to address the needs of our businesses. Um, so before long, and after a few city council meetings, many of which were uh, stressful to say the least, uh, we saw the, this come to fruition. And um, it's now called the Blue Ribbon Committee, and it's been redesigned to address the needs of the arts community and nonprofits in Portsmouth. But initially what it did was it found solutions for outdoor dining for restaurants in Portsmouth who had no uh, immediate solutions for outdoor dining. Uh, sadly for Black Trumpet, that ended up being just a few tables, which as soon as it got cold, we weren't allowed to have heaters. So uh, pretty much not gonna have outdoor dining at Black Trumpet, which is a whole other can of worms I'm not gonna open in this presentation. Um, but what it did do also, this task force ultimately uh, created or allowed the creation of the formation of the pop-up New Hampshire lot. So um, we at Black Trumpet, without having that outdoor seating, direly needed this outdoor lot. And it's really a testament to community coming together. Um, if you look at this uh, Instagram post, it's from the last day of our pop-up New Hampshire lot, which was in the Bridge Street location, Bridge Street parking lot in downtown Portsmouth. So the little yellow shed here that you see uh, put out a lot of food in a safe and hyper-distanced outdoor food and entertainment venue from the beginning of August to the end of October. The revenue we generated from that ensured our survival at Black Trumpet in the gap between the two waves of PPP money. We would not have survived without it. And we are grateful to everyone who volunteered and of course to the city for ultimately seeing the light so that we could see some light ourselves. I chose to name the shed after uh, a new market native, Hope Still Cheswell, who built homes here, including the one directly uh, kitty corner to the lot. Um, and uh, so he built uh, the John Paul Jones house, which was right, right across the street there. And uh, that was in the 18th century. And Hope Still Cheswell uh, also was, uh, you know, not, not just a great name, I'd uh, chosen for the shed, but uh, it had once been the name I had picked for a restaurant that never ended up opening in Newmarket. But not coincidentally, it also pays tribute to a great historic figure whose son, Wentworth Cheswell, is believed to be the first elected Black official in the U.S. So for me, hope still is a powerful word. It has a, a history that resonates um, with all of us, or should. And for me, it was also the saving grace of being able to survive the worst of the pandemic back in the summer through the fall. In its history, Black Trumpet has fed a small percentage of our local population. I mentioned earlier that this can be read as a sort of elitism. Most people who dine with us are celebrating a special occasion. The stark awakening I have personally experienced in this last year has to do with the realization that there is a vast population who has never heard of Black Trumpet, 
and who honestly doesn't care about it, nor should they. Many of that population are food insecure. They are concerned about where the next meal is coming from, not why they have to wait for a table on a busy night. Yet another reminder that our privilege is an extraordinary blinding luxury. I still believe there is a need for a place we can all go to celebrate whatever our means and whatever the occasion. I hope Black Trumpet can continue to serve that need. But I'm also eager to follow through on the vision to bring justice to the forefront of the conversation about our local food system. I am hardly alone in believing that food security is a number one priority as we step carefully into the aftermath of this pandemic. So I'm making my first priority going forward that we feed people. It sounds pretty simple. Working with Gather has led from a program funded by PPP money to an ongoing series of meals that we've produced at uh, both Black Trumpet and Atlantic Grill. The Atlantic Grill is a restaurant run by the Labrie family in Rye that was so gracious in donating their dormant banquet kitchen to, to us and to my staff to be able to scale the production of uh, food, much of it local food, for the Gather membership and community. I'm confident that soon we're gonna see the next evolutionary step in this collaboration between Black Trumpet and Gather, perhaps with Atlantic Grill as well, so stay tuned for that. Earlier I made an allusion to uh, some of the programs that we've created. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about a few of those here as we consider this as another way forward. Second only to the imperative need, uh, imperative need to feed people is the idea that our community is rich with talent and experience that can be turned into education and empowerment. I think about that a lot at Black Trumpet because we have the privilege of being visible. If you look at the first two photos in this slide, uh, recognizing the diasporas of immigration in the food we eat, and in particular, the feminist-centric lineage that has nurtured generations through our history. This has become very important. This was our Women of the World series, which brought women, uh, not necessarily professional cooks, uh, into my kitchen at Black Trumpet to cook with us and to teach us and to educate our consumers about their native cuisine. I'd like to continue uh, to make sure that we continue this initiative um, and assure everyone that we will in fact uh, continue to be doing that. So if you know any uh, women out there who represent a culture that we haven't represented yet, feel free to reach out to me. Um, in the middle photo there, that is uh, my handsome son. And uh, he represents the idea that we need to be bringing children to food rather than food to children. And I, I think we need to be doing that early and often, both on farms and in kitchens, to learn not only how to cook and be subsistent, but also how to recognize quality ingredients and ultimately use them to feed others. When children come into contact with food at its source, it opens their minds, it makes them not afraid, it makes them not squeamish about eating an ingredient that they don't understand. It gives them power over their own diet. And I think that's really vital. The next slide over uh, features a gentleman by the name of Najee Brown, who's a local playwright, thespian, and all around great guy. Uh, he's come to Black Trumpet and cooked with us in our kitchen as part of our Savor the Soul series, which we do in conjunction um, with the Seacoast Rep Theater. And in which Najee, my staff and I, put out a menu of dishes that are culturally relevant uh, to Najee's African-American heritage. And the food we make there, which includes amazing renditions of jerk chicken, collard greens, rice and peas, um, can be bought. And it has been bought uh, by some people who come for takeout. But a far greater quantity than we sell uh, is given to gather to be distributed to families in need. And the last slide here is Gather once again, and that's working in the Atlantic Grill kitchen. Um, that's John Plaza, our, our uh, 
bartender and bar manager. And we're going to continue working with Gather, as I've already mentioned, to produce more meals at whatever capacity we can, we can pull off. Uh, and we hope that relationship will be everlasting. So uh, this slide smacks a little of desperation, but that's what this year has been. We look at, uh, as our third way forward, everything else. So not just Savor the Soul, Women of the World, working with Gather, uh, hopefully rebirthing abundance, uh, doing our grab-and-go meals, which have been so somewhat successful, selling at uh, local breweries and uh, wine shops. We're gonna be continuing the work of Heirloom Harvest Project. We're doing Bring Your Bubble events at Black Trumpet, which allow people to come with a group they are secure with to dine together. Um, groups of two to 12 can do that all through the month of March in the first half of April. And also Zero Foot Foodprint, which is an initiative that was started by a chef in San Francisco that is an incentive uh, to support regenerative farming practices. And we'll be hearing a lot more about that in the months to come. I wanna point out that um, in my experience over the last decade of doing this kind of work, um, these are the bookends. There are books as bookends and they are um, The Town That Food Saved by Ben Hewitt and The Stop by Nick Saul and Andrea Curtis. During this last decade, um, I've done a lot of learning and the book on the left the town that food saved sent me and two influential colleagues and friends of mine from Portsmouth to Vermont's Northeast Kingdom, where we met the three entrepreneurs whose work was the subject of the book's very bold title, How One Community Found Vitality in Local Food. So we went on this pilgrimage and came back very inspired by the work that they had done and how that might be applied to our community. The other book on the right, The Stop, was published in Canada in 2013, but didn't come to me until 2020 uh, via Deb Anthony, who's the executive director of Gather. So she and I have obviously been working closely together. Uh, this book has become a Bible for Deb, and for good reason. Um, it's out of print, but can still be ordered, used, um, and there are still some new copies out there in the world. But uh, the subtitle of, of uh, the book, The Stop, is The Fight, Fight for Good Food. And it talks about transforming communities and inspiring a movement. That, you know, is not where it ends. It's, it's really just the beginning. And I feel like when we look at the issues that have come up over this last decade, from composting, labeling, supporting farmers, greenwashing and co-opting, like we've addressed all of these animal husbandry, sustainable seafood, food waste, social justice. Um, all of these are part of fixing a broken food system. And these two books have been vital uh, in my thinking and that of, of several others in our community to looking at potential solutions to move forward. So as my presentation comes to an end, um, I've created this list of bullets for us to think about as we look toward the future of our food system. I believe that we need to start with forgiveness and there's gonna be a real need for that. Whether it's forgiving loans, whether it's forgiving rent or forgiving behaviors that we've seen, you know, in the election year, in the pandemic, uh, people near and dear to our hearts behaving in ways we didn't like. We need to start with a fresh start. Equity, obviously this goes without saying, yet we seem to be still quite far from achieving goals of equity across our food system. It's not just us, it's everywhere. It's a caste system in this world and we can do better. Access, with access uh, to local food and to all food for everyone, it seems, uh, again, a daunting task, but we know it can be done. We know it because we've seen it happening and progress being made uh, at a rapid rate of increase. And we know that there is a possibility that down the road, everyone will have access to good food. 
dignity is so important. And when we talk about Gather's membership, we are talking about something that's kind of a uh, language that's associated typically with elite and exclusive clubs. That's what it should be. You know, we should be thinking about everyone who's hungry uh, in the exact same breath as the people who are coming in to dine in restaurants like mine. And that's the language that I would like to see and embrace going forward. Uh, it requires a, a shift in thinking for most of us. Like I said, the email I just read, it may not be someone who we imagine to be hungry, but it's, it's everyone. Everyone could be hungry right now, you know? And we need to just be thinking about that and making sure dignity is part of the conversation. Education and empowerment. I already talked about this uh, in a couple of different ways, but whatever facility there is going forward that gives a home to places like Gather and places like Three River Farmers Alliance, in those facilities, there is an opportunity to have an educational component that will empower people to better understand food, better understand cooking, and I personally hope to be a part of that component. And I know there are lots of others who want to be a part of it too. Nutrition is something everyone has a right to. It's a fundamental human right. And I'll leave that there. We think that goes without saying. And finally, regenerative and restorative practices. Those are not the same thing. Um, we do, when we think about sustainability in the future, we have to be thinking about generations down the road. We have to be thinking about a broader picture than post-war America has thought of until now. Uh, there's a lot of energy in moving in the right direction and giving this idea momentum, but I absolutely think that's part of the conversation about our future. So <laughs> this wraps it up. And I just wanna say, uh, that I'm very grateful to have had the opportunity to make this presentation. And the phrase that you see here and on the next slide is a wonderful Latin phrase and it's pretty straightforward. And it's echoed in many cultures around the world um, who are maybe a little less squeamish than ours, though not so much in our uh, self-centered culture. I think it's time to embrace it. And the phrase is from death comes life. As morbid, as this may seem as a way to end this presentation and this gathering, I see it as the contrary. We've all been through trauma this last year, much of it harrowing. We now have the opportunity to pick up the scraps, much as you see here on this slide, the scraps that remain of this year, and to learn from the gift of resiliency that we have demonstrated, to build something together that will serve future gener generations by ensuring that everyone has access to good, clean food. Again, it's been my pleasure to share my story with you today and thank you all for your time, your dedication and your service to our food community. And thank you, New Hampshire Food Alliance for being a hub for good ideas and solutions.